Ireland is Europe's western outpost. Battered by the Atlantic, it's the last landfall before America. And its history is just as turbulent. This is a story of brutal conflict, which has divided the island to this day, with the north part of the UK and the south a republic. It's a tale of bloody rebellion going back more than a thousand years. The Irish loved to rebel and revolt and used the cloak of religion to disguise their unhappiness. Of a land of saints and scholars turned into an island with deep divisions. This is not the competition between a great right and a great wrong, but is the competition between two great rights. A people devastated by famine. It's the only country in the world in the 21st century whose population now is smaller than it was 150 years ago. And transformed from poor immigrants to American presidents. Immigration offered a lifeline to escape poverty, destitution, and to essentially build a life abroad. This is the tale of an ancient culture which has conquered the modern world. This is Ireland, a thousand years of history. Travel back 1,000 years and Ireland is on the cusp of great change. This is an island of Gaelic kings, monks and Viking settlers. An island trading goods and ideas across Europe. In 1002, the legendary High King Brian Boru becomes the first ruler to unite Ireland. Until then, Ireland wasn't ruled by one king, but by many. There were hundreds of kings, each ruling over an individual lordship, but at the same time, each king was attempting to assert his authority over neighboring kings. So there was a constant friction. Since the fifth century, Ireland is divided into five main provinces, Munster, Ulster, Connacht, Leinster and Meath. Each with its own king, often fighting for supremacy. There's references from an early date to the concept of an Ard Ri or a High King of all Ireland, but this wasn't a political reality. For centuries, the O'Neill dynasty styled themselves as High Kings. But none of them seem able to unite Ireland until 1002, when a new High King seizes power, the King of Munster, Brian Boru. Brian Boru is famous because he's the first king that really made this aspiration of High King in Irish history a reality because he temporarily exercised control over the whole of Ireland. He goes to the Church of Armagh, which is the seat of the cult of St. Patrick, so the, the most powerful church in Ireland and he donates 20 ounces of silver. And as a result, his royal secretary then writes in the Book of Armagh, which is a manuscript which survives from that time, that Brian Boru is Imperator Scotorum, which means the emperor of all the Gaels. Brian Boru wins the backing of the church and is the most powerful high king Ireland has seen. He rules over an island that has already made its mark on the European map. They had a culture and a language and a civilization and a legal system of their own which predated that of ancient Rome and which many ways was superior to that of ancient Rome. Medieval Ireland is a thriving hub of education. Ever since the fall of the Roman Empire, most of Europe has been plunged into the Dark Ages. Learning and culture seem lost except in Ireland. Since the sixth century, Ireland's monasteries have become renowned. If you want to learn, you come to Ireland. It's interesting to think of modern equivalents to what these institutions represented in the Middle Ages. There has been the suggestion that they could be compared to, say, Ivy League universities. And certainly by the eighth century, 
Ireland has established its reputation as an important centre for learning within Europe. And we hear of scholars travelling from Britain to Ireland for their education. But also Ireland has this developing reputation of being a land of saints and scholars. Irish monasteries are home to some of the great manuscripts of the medieval period. Lavish copies of the Gospel, like the Book of Kells. But they also have huge influence abroad. Irish saints like Columba and Columbanus spread their version of Christianity by setting up monasteries. From Iona in Scotland and Lindisfarne in England, to others in France and Italy. The cult of those saints is then established in places outside Ireland and, and brings prestige to the Irish people internationally. Eleventh century Ireland is also trading with the rest of Europe. More than 200 years before Brian Boru, the Vikings had started invading Ireland and establishing settlements. In 841, the Vikings saw the potential of a spot on the banks of the River Liffey and founded Dublin. By Brian's reign, it has become a site of strategic importance. Dublin was really something of an international hub in this period. They were importing silk from Byzantium and spices and luxury goods from across what was the known world at this time. It commanded a great deal of wealth. Um, it had access to an extensive navy. It had links politically and economically across quite a wide area. So it became one of the goals of kings who wanted to rule all Ireland to hold Dublin, because if you held Dublin, you had resources that made it hard for any other ruler to challenge your position. For Brian Boru, the Dublin Vikings mean trouble. There's obviously dissenting voices. Not everybody wants to be part of this new unified Irish project that Brian Boru is at the helm of. And so what happens in the year 1013 is there's an alliance between the Kings of Leinster, which is the province in the southeast of Ireland, and Dublin, which is a Viking ruled port. The Vikings don't want Brian Boru controlling Dublin. So on Good Friday, 1014, Brian's troops face his enemies from Leinster and Dublin at the Battle of Clontarf. As English school children learn about 1066, Irish school children, if they've heard of anything of medieval history, they would probably have heard of the Battle of Clontarf. Now, the thing that makes this a particularly important battle is that it didn't just involve forces within Ireland. The Dublin Vikings drew on their allies based in the Orkney Islands, and it's quite possible there was a contingent of Danish mercenaries who also engaged in the battle as well. So it would have been one of the biggest, if not the biggest, battle fought on Irish soil um, up to this time. Despite his enemy's foreign reinforcements, Brian and his army win the day. But it doesn't end well for him. He is slain by a Viking. He had successfully united Ireland under his control, but this all unraveled after his death. And so what we find in the politics of the 11th century is that warfare increases, there's more large-scale conflicts, and there's various contenders have kind of thrown their hat into the ring to try and become the main man ruling all of Ireland. 150 years later, in the 1160s, Ireland's leading families are still jostling for Brian Boru's level of power as High King. And their fight will change Ireland forever when they invite an English king to settle their differences. It's 1166, more than 150 years since the death of Brian Boru. And the kings of Ireland are fighting for power. Many men want to be High King, but their infighting will introduce a new threat to Irish power from across the water. Starting with Henry II, over the next eight centuries, English kings will battle to stamp their authority on Ireland. In 1166, Rory O'Connor, the King of Connacht, won the battle for the High Kingship of Ireland. And this was wonderful for him, but not so great 
for the followers of the ousted High King. One of those, one of the most prominent, was the King of Leinster, Dermot McMurrough. With Rory O'Connor in power, Dermot loses his land and is forced to flee Ireland. But he wants his land back. So he turns to the King of England, Henry II, for backup. A decade before, Henry II had considered an Irish invasion of his own. He'd even got the blessing of Pope Adrian IV, the only English Pope in history. The Pope gave his blessing because he wanted the Irish Church to take more direction from Rome. But the invasion never went ahead. And by 1166, when Dermot comes to ask Henry for help, the English king has problems with his own empire. Henry did not have time to waste on an Irish adventure. So instead of um, offering Dermot any direct help, he allowed Dermot to recruit from among his own men. Dermot sought help from an English nobleman, the Earl of Pembroke, Richard Fitzgilbert, better known as Strongbow. Dermot approached Strongbow, offering him the hand of his daughter Aoife in marriage and succession to his kingdom of Leinster if Strongbow would help him to recover the kingdom of Leinster. In 1169, Strongbow's men start landing in Ireland. It's a force more technically advanced than anything the Irish have ever seen. Irish warriors had light armor, they had axes, spears. Um, the projectiles would be propelled by a sling or perhaps darts. The English, by contrast, had heavy cavalry. More importantly, the English had archers and they had the military technology to produce arrows after arrows so that they could loose salvo after salvo against the Irish and still have weapons left over. The attack is a success. Strongbow is rewarded with land, money, and marriage to Dermot's daughter. But Strongbow is about to get even luckier. Dermot dies and leaves his crown to his new son-in-law. Strongbow becomes King of Leinster. And to King Henry II of England, he's starting to look like a rival. Henry II could not afford to let his vassal acquire an independent kingdom of Ireland. Henry had to intervene. In 1171, Henry II becomes the first English king to set foot on Irish soil. And surprisingly, he doesn't have to put up a fight. This is a man who controlled most of Britain and two thirds of France. This was not his first rodeo. When he approached Ireland, Henry already had papal blessing for an invasion. He also let it be known that a delegation of Irishmen had approached him asking for his help to protect them against Strongbow and his followers. Henry's timing is perfect. He arrives in October, when bad weather traditionally stops armies from fighting. This gave Henry time for negotiation before any concerted uh, resistance could be mounted against him. And king after king, provincial king after provincial king, lined up to submit to him. These Irish kings came to Henry because of his overwhelming military superiority. They agreed to submit to him because he promised them protection. As king of England, he was quite likely to go away and leave them to their own devices. Henry was able to annex the entire island of Ireland without spilling any blood. In 1175, Ireland's last High King, Rory O'Connor, agrees to the Treaty of Windsor. The treaty declares that everything that the English have so far belongs to Henry, and everything else is left to O'Connor. Ireland is effectively split in two, Gaelic Ireland and English Ireland. And it doesn't take long for the English to develop a narrative that the mission was about civilizing Irish savages. At the end of the 12th century, they had the medieval equivalent of a spin doctor, Gerald of Wales, 
write a book to help justify the English military takeover. He describes Ireland as this wonderful land teeming with resources. If only they could be tapped by people who know how to use them. The Irish were too lazy, according to Gerald, but the English had the industry necessary. It also talks of Ireland as this island of wonders, where women have beards, where the Irish do unspeakable things to farmyard animals. If only the English could come in and impose some order, he argues, the Irish could be brought into the light. Dermot's invitation for help would have far-reaching consequences. The invitation merely opened the door. The English propped it open and kept coming. By 1254, Henry III is king, and he stipulates that Ireland is never to be separated from the English crown. But England doesn't have full control. The ruined remains of Castle Roche are the lasting remnants of an era when England only controlled a small area around Dublin, known as the Pale. That was a recognisable English part of the country. And beyond that was beyond the Pale. The word Pale is, comes from the idea of uh, a protective wall uh, defending this more settled area. Beyond the Pale, the Irish are left to their own devices. Until the 16th century, when an English king starts demanding loyalty to the crown and a new religion. It's 1533 and Henry VIII's love life is making history. His first marriage has failed to produce a male heir. Henry wants to marry Anne Boleyn but the Pope won't sanction a divorce. So Henry joins the European Protestant Reformation. He ditches Rome and appoints himself head of the new Church of England, paving the way for a clash with Ireland. Well, that was hugely significant in an Irish context because it meant that the population of Ireland, which was Catholic, had to convert to Protestantism. But Henry just can't get the Irish to convert. And when his daughter Elizabeth I accedes the throne, the problem becomes more serious. Protestant England is under threat from Catholic Spain. In 1588, the Spanish Armada attempts an English invasion. At that juncture, Catholicism comes to be perceived as a potentially threatening force for the security of England itself. So that certainly from the 1580s onwards, it becomes part of the government agenda to force a Protestant Reformation on Ireland, whether the Irish population want it or not. But converting Ireland is still a huge challenge. The religion of Protestantism was English, but people in Ireland spoke Irish, and so there was a basic barrier there. The Catholic Church really fought back, and Ireland was the only country in Europe where the Counter-Reformation succeeded against the wishes of a Protestant ruler. So in that sense, Ireland was very, very much uh, an outlier. Elizabeth is determined. By the 1590s, she has subdued the Irish in Munster, Leinster and Connacht. But her reign becomes mired in Irish rebellions. Ostensibly, they were about religion, but the Irish loved to rebel and revolt and use the cloak of religion to disguise their unhappiness with an increasingly aggressive English political state. They're as much against the encroachment of state power as they are about religion. The most important was the Nine Years' War. The Gaelic lords, Hugh O'Neill, Earl of Tyrone, and Red Hugh O'Donnell, rose up in rebellion. Despite help from Catholic Spain, the rebel Irish lords are crushed by Elizabeth's army. 
On the 14th of September, 1607, O'Neill and O'Donnell and their families leave Ulster for the continent. It spelt the end of the old Gaelic order because six of the nine counties in Ulster, the lands belonging to the great Gaelic lords, were expropriated and then they were reallocated. Reallocating the lands of the Catholic earls presents England with an opportunity. Instead of converting the Irish to Protestantism, Ireland is to be made a Protestant place by introducing settlers from England and from Scotland to displace the Irish. In 1609, King James I begins the plantation of Ulster, an attempt to bring Protestant settlers into Ireland to make it a loyal colony. From the late decades of the 16th century, right through to the end of the 17th century, about 350,000 English, Scottish and Welsh migrants came to Ireland. And it's from this moment that we see very intense colonization, plantation, uh, civilization, and I put that in inverted commas, Anglicization occur uh, across the island of Ireland. We saw extensive urbanization and these towns growing up all over the province, land being drained and enclosed, orchards being planted, because part of the ideology of plantation actually involved civilizing the landscape and making it more like the English or a lowland countryside. Estates were created uh, and fortifications were built. So for example, the walls of Derry date from the plantation period. They are still intact. Maps from 1622 show how the settlements were well planned and took shape. The land is parceled out in blocks of up to 2,000 acres across six counties. Armagh, Fermanagh, Cavan, Coleraine, Donegal and Tyrone. Only one-fifth of the land of Ulster remains in Irish hands. It brought in a very large Protestant settler population which has been in situ for the last 400 years. And with that, it has brought about severe divisions and tensions within society, particularly in the northern part of Ireland. Many of the issues arising in the most recent conflict in the north of Ireland have their roots all the way back to the Ulster plantation of the 17th century. The first years of the Ulster plantation are relatively peaceful, but the loss of power and land mean Catholic resentment is building. In 1641, rebellion will erupt on an unprecedented scale. Autumn 1641, rebellion is in the air. In the last 40 years, hundreds of thousands of Protestant settlers have flooded into Ireland. Trouble has been brewing for decades. In October, a violent rebellion erupts, which starts a cycle of rebellion and repression, which will last for centuries. At the time, people were quite shocked by it, but the real surprise was it took so long to happen. Uh, and there was deep resentment among the native population over their dispossession. A woman called Elizabeth Price is part of the Protestant community attacked in Portadown, County Armagh. In a witness statement, she describes over 100 Protestants, including five of her children, being rounded up. She says the rebels, having stripped them all of their clothes, cast them all into prison. After two weeks, Elizabeth says they are driven like beasts to a bridge above the River Bourne and thrown into the water. Those who try to escape are beaten or shot. 
it exploded with tremendous violence and ferocity, with attacks initially on the settler Protestant community by the native Irish, but then retaliatory attacks by the colonial government. And before long, it spiralled into very severe and widespread violence across the island. We saw very, very, very uh, brutal, bloody massacres occurring across the country. Over 8,000 witness accounts, like the tale of Elizabeth Price, are recorded by the British authorities in the years after the rebellion. These dramatic tales of Catholic savagery against the Protestants spread to England and the continent. We get these lurid stories of attacks on civilians with women and children, old people being targeted and killed in, in very nasty ways. An awful lot of this is unsubstantiated. This is an era of religious divide across Europe. For Protestants from England to the Netherlands, this is all the evidence they need to prove that the Catholic Irish are godless savages. It was alleged from quite an early point that there had been a premeditated massacre of all of the Protestants in the country. In other words, that this had been planned from Rome. It was used not just in the 1640s, but over the, the next centuries to whip up anti-Catholic hysteria in England. The propaganda value is hard to overstate. The English reaction to the rebellion is brutal. It is led by Oliver Cromwell, one of the most hated figures in Ireland to this day. In England, Cromwell would be regarded as this great parliamentary hero. In Ireland, he's excoriated as God's executioner, responsible for the bloodlettings. In 1649, Cromwell's parliamentary forces have won the civil war in England. Charles I is dead, and Cromwell can now turn his attention to Ireland. He lands on the outskirts of Dublin with 20,000 troops at his disposal. The rebelling Irish Catholics have been controlling most of the country for eight years. Cromwell's campaign of revenge against them is barbaric. There's no doubt that the Cromwellian conquest is one of the most traumatic periods of Irish history. The demographic loss alone is catastrophic with loss probably somewhere in the region of a third of the overall population. Cromwell has gone down in folk memory as one of the great ogres in Irish history. My students hiss whenever I mention his name. Cromwell's troops attack Drogheda first where he boasts of slaughtering 3,500 people. He writes back to England to say God has blessed his endeavors in the town. Cromwell describes people filled with much terror and doesn't think even 30 of them escaped with their lives. Wexford is taken next, and a ruthless pattern of massacre is repeated in towns and villages across the land. It was one of the darkest moments in our history, full stop. There were incidences of mass killing, what we would call today ethnic cleansing, and atrocities committed, uh, very comparable to what we would have seen in a country like Rwanda. After nine months, Cromwell leaves, confident the rebellion is crushed. The consequences for Irish Catholics are disastrous. Their religion is forbidden, and a ferocious reconquest begins as nearly all the remaining land owned by Catholics is confiscated. In 1652, Parliament in London passes the Act of Settlement, a radical bill decreeing that the rebel Catholics are to lose their estates and be exiled to regions of poor land in the West. Two and a half million acres of Irish land is confiscated. We also see Catholics being transplanted from their uh, estates and sent to Connacht, to hell or to Connacht. Others um, were uh, transported to the Caribbean as indentured slaves. 
The post-war settlement after Cromwell uh, witnesses probably the greatest single transfer of land anywhere in Western Europe during what's called the early modern period before the war breaks out in, in 1641. And Catholics own probably somewhere around 70% of the land in Ireland. By the end of the conflict, that has fallen to just over 10%. The confiscation stokes more Catholic resentment. Nearly 40 years later, Ireland becomes the main battleground for a wider European fight between Catholics and Protestants. In 1685, King James II inherits the British throne, leaving Protestants across Britain and Europe worried because the new King James is a Catholic. For many in England, this was not acceptable. So they approached his Protestant son-in-law, William of Orange from the Netherlands, and invited him to drive James from power, which he did. James fled to France, and then from France comes to Ireland, knowing that as a Catholic, he would probably receive a warm welcome from Irish Catholics, which he did. On March the 12th, 1689, he lands at Kinsale in County Cork with about 1,800 French troops. Soon, thousands of Catholic Irishmen are rallying to his flag. The Catholic population had suffered dreadfully during the mid 17th century and had definitely become second class citizens. So James coming as a Catholic king to Ireland, he was seen as a deliverer, as a savior. James marches on to Dublin and by April, his army has surrounded Derry, one of the last bastions of Protestant resistance. Six months before, Jacobite forces had tried to take Derry but were stopped when 13 apprentice boys closed the city gates. Now, James attempts another siege. A Jacobite force that included the king himself laid siege to Derry for over 100 days. And Derry basically refused to surrender. And that's why no surrender is associated with the city of Derry. And the siege is commemorated in Derry uh, uh, until today. This escalating crisis brings William himself to Ireland with a large army. The Protestant King William faces the Catholic James on the banks of the River Boyne in July 1690. And William wins. The battle itself was a bit of a damp squib, uh, so it's very hard to say it was a great military victory, but it was of huge symbolic significance. At the first sign of defeat, James flees on horseback to Dublin and then on to France. His cowardice is condemned. After his flight after the Battle of the Boyne, he's termed by the native Irish as Seamus Ashoka, which roughly translates into James the Shit. Meanwhile, Irish Protestants have celebrated King Billy as a hero ever since. Today, the Battle of the Boyne is commemorated by Orange Lodges on the 12th of July, even though the battle was fought on the 1st of July. There's a lot of myths around William of Orange. Firstly, he's portrayed as this very sectarian individual. And in fact, when it came to religion, he favored religious toleration. He is portrayed as this great horseman, when in fact, he wasn't a great horseman. In fact, he probably had a humpy back. He hardly spoke English. People don't always want to hear truths about these great historical figures. So stories like those don't go down very well in some quarters. After the victories in the Williamite Wars, the Protestant government doubles down on Irish Catholics. From 1695, a raft of penal laws are brought in to shore up the Protestant oligarchy, now ruling Ireland, and to keep Catholics in their place. This penal legislation is used effectively to keep over 80% of the Irish population in subservience. Catholics are banned from voting, from holding office, from bearing arms, and even from owning a horse. So we see this 
programme of legislation being put in place by the Irish Parliament that is basically designed to keep Irish Catholics uh, suppressed. The devolved Irish Parliament that meets in Dublin is entirely restricted to Protestants. But their freedom to legislate is limited by the greater power of Westminster. Soon, even Protestant frustration is growing. In the 1770s and 80s, the American and French revolutions provided growing inspiration for a group of Irish Protestants who set out to unite all Irishmen, including Catholics, in the cause of equality and liberty from England. It's an alliance that would once have seemed unthinkable. The founder of the United Irishmen is Theobald Wolfe Tone. Tone came from a Protestant background, but yet he was extremely radical. Some of the most radical rebels were, were Protestant. In the 1790s, Tone and his United Irishmen begin to campaign for constitutional reform, but they are getting nowhere. So they grow more radical. In 1796, Tone travels to the new French Republic in search of assistance. They agree to put together a very large expeditionary force that is to sail to Ireland and it sets off in 1796 with Wolf Tone on board. This has up to 15,000 French, experienced uh, French soldiers on board. If they had landed, it's one of the great what ifs in Irish history, there is a very good chance that they would have, with the support of the United Irishmen in Ireland itself, managed to seize control of the country. But treacherous storms prevent the landing. Two years later, the United Irishmen attempt to start a revolution, this time without the French. By the time the rebellion breaks out in 1798, the United Irishmen are, are much depleted and the rebellion is, is restricted really to the south uh, east in Wexford uh, and up in the northeast in Antrim. And after a couple of weeks is crushed by British forces. Wolf Tone is captured by the British and sentenced to hang. But rather than face the noose, he cuts his own throat. In response to the rebellion, the Irish Parliament is abolished. Ireland is now ruled directly from Westminster. In 1801, it is legally united with Britain. The United Kingdom is born. But the spirit of Irish rebellion won't die. The repeal of that union then became the goal of a whole generation of later Irish nationalists, both constitutional nationalists, but also Republican nationalists. The beginning of the 1800s marks a new dawn for Ireland. After centuries of rebellion, the whole island of Ireland is now legally tied to Britain. In 1801, the United Kingdom begins. But in the course of the next 100 years, Ireland will make its own distinct journey. It is a century that will bring dramatic change to the people and landscape of Ireland. At the start of the 19th century, 80% of the Irish population is still Catholic. But they are ruled by Britain and its Protestant King George III. Catholics have very little land. If you've got land, you've got power and you've got wealth. The English come and they confiscate Irish land and they redistribute it to those who are loyal. Catholic people have no political power. They're banned from public office. It's illegal to have Catholic MPs. Then in steps Daniel O'Connell, a Catholic lawyer who is able to mobilize and politicize the Irish people on a scale never seen before. His aim? To give Irish Catholics a voice in the British Parliament. And to get it not through violence, but using the power of the people. 
He had witnessed some of the violence in the French Revolution at first hand and had throughout his life an abhorrence of political violence. So he sought to bring about change, a very significant change, through peaceful political means. One of his great strategies, of course, was to be organized at every single level, right down to the parish, to get people uh, involved. They would pay a subscription to be involved, be it as small as a penny, but in order to have mass engagement and in that way to create pressure. Despite Catholics being banned from Parliament for the last 150 years, in 1828, O'Connell stands in a by-election and he wins. Technically, Catholics can't become MPs, but the British government realise they'll have a mass revolt on their hands if they deny O'Connell his seat. They are forced to compromise. The law is changed. O'Connell takes his seat in Westminster and becomes known as the Liberator. Spurred on by this success, O'Connell fights next to repeal the Act of Union. He wanted to see a parliament once again in Dublin. This parliament, however, would not be similar to the old colonial parliament, which was restricted to the small Protestant colonial elite. This would be a parliament open to all the people of Ireland and certainly to the Catholics as well. So it would be a very different type of parliament. He also organised these huge, huge monster rallies where he would come and speak. I'm sure most people couldn't hear him, but his words would have been relayed down through the crowd. But it was more the fact of these huge gatherings of people engaging the entire population. So this wasn't a campaign of the elite. This wasn't a campaign restricted to a handful of politicians. This was the Catholic population of Ireland together trying to bring about effective change through peaceful means. Alarmed at this mass public display of protest, the British claim the movement and O'Connell are seditious. O'Connell is arrested and spends six months in prison. When he is released, approaching 70, and with his health failing, he cannot re-energize his followers. When he dies three years later, his campaign for repeal dies with him. By then, the people are facing a crisis that will transform Ireland. In 